Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to, to our session, which has uh, the title Growing Forest and Landscape Restoration Finance. Uh, so this, this session is co-organized by FAO and WWF, and also with participation from Eco Agriculture Partners and uh, New Africa. Um, well, during the next hour, uh, we'll be having a, a conversation with, um, with three of our invitees. We'll, I will introduce them in a, in a few minutes. But uh, uh, the, the context of our conversation, uh, I think we are all familiar with the exceptional momentum that we are living uh, in terms of the, pol the political conditions that have been created to upscale work on landscape approach and very specifically on forest landscape restoration. Uh, many of our organizations have been involved during the last couple of years on uh, clear understanding on these agendas and enabling the conditions for projects to scale up. So I think this is the core of our conversation today is where we are on this process and uh, what are the main bottlenecks, the main challenges and the needed next steps. Um, I, I will not take longer in terms of the introduction of the, of the session. Um, and uh, I will start by inviting uh, Yuga from WF Germany. Uh, and Yuga uh, will help us uh, to understand exactly the context where we are in this moment on the, on the, the landscapes uh, uh, and forest landscape restoration agenda. And uh, will we'll be followed by... Um, a contribution from Seth Shames from Eco Agriculture Partners, also in terms of the work that is being developed now between uh, Eco Ag and, uh, and FAO on, on, this, uh, on this same topic. So this will set the, the, set the scene and then we'll have a conversation with three of our invitees. So no further, Yuga, please. Thank you. So good afternoon. The growing demand of natural resources has put increasing pressure on biodiversity and associated ecosystem services with severe impacts on human well-being in the future. The current pressures on lands are really huge, yet they are expected to continue growing to meet the needs of nearly 10 billion people by 2050. Biodiversity loss and climate change further jeopardize the health and productivity of land. Therefore, the maintenance of natural resources requires a transversal approach to conservation that takes local reality into account and integrates with regional management. In this sense, landscape approach represents a conceptual framework that brings together different actors and their objectives. The aim is to reconcile social, economic, and environmental interests with local level action planning while at the same time considering broader goals, such as outcomes, such as those set by national commitments or international commitments. Territorial planning has the potential to make the opportunities, conflicts, and potential of each area clear to multiple actors, allowing for transparent discussion and decision-making based on evidence of the priorities and choices needed to reach different objectives. So forest landscape restoration forms part of territorial planning process, and it's more than just planting trees. It is about um, restoring a whole landscape forward to meet present and future needs and to offer multiple benefits and land uses over time. So FLR refers to reforestation, but also natural regeneration, agroforestry, agriculture, protected forests, uh, forest management. Right now, as Luis already mentioned, there is an important momentum for FLR. 150 million hectares of world's deforested and degraded lands shall be restored by 2020 under the bond challenge. And the New York Declaration on Forests even exceeded the restoration goal um, by 200 million hectares up to 350 million hectares to um, 2030. So um, we're going to I have the big challenge um, how to reach the restoration goal of 350 million hectares until 2030. 
for sure. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. So, for instance, public funding might be necessary as a first step in order to prepare and build infrastructure so that private funding can be attracted. And in countries with weak law, weak law enforcement or unfavorable governance structures and corruption issues, alternative income sources need to be considered, such as red money, where restoration and reforestation will help to reduce deforestation and further degradation of the primary forests. However, mobilizing these funds to achieve landscape restoration at scale remains a really big challenge. And once there are public or private funding lines available, how to make sure to get the money hit the ground? What is pretty clear, there are plenty of opportunities out there. Uh, just one example, only like three weeks ago, we have been to Chile for a WWF New Generation Plantation Study Tour. Um, Chile suffered the most catastrophic fire event um, and, um, in, his, in his history. Around 600,000 hectares were burned this year um, of plantations, native forests, agricultural land, and grasslands. Half of it was related to plantations and uh, native forests. Being part of a small group from 15 different countries with different perspectives, experiences, and knowledges, we visited different locations, talked to people, trying to find the answer to the most burning question. How can landscape restoration after large-scale forest fires improve social ecological resilience? For sure, extensive homogeneous pine and eucalyptus plantation create the perfect conditions for fire. While the timber companies have the potential to, uh, to um, and the possibilities just uh, to restore um, and to check on the model, smallholders don't have these possibilities and capacities. We are now doing a pre-feasibility study with smallholders business case, as around like 50% of the land is owned by smallholders, changing their business from homogeneous pine plantation to native species and income generation due to non-timber forest products, has the potential to change the landscape to a mosaic. And um, a mosaic system prevent, uh, prevent the occurrence of mega fires. As WWF want to contribute to the success of forest landscape restoration, we just organized the FLR finance workshop, which took place yesterday. Besides others, we did seek for solutions to overcome the financing gap and to attract more private financing to scale up FLR projects and approaches. We were discussing different project cases, such as the Chile case, with a variety of experts with different backgrounds from finance and public sector consultings, firms and organizations. So the results of the workshop will be presented tomorrow at KFW panel discussion. And please feel free to join, uh, to join it as well. In this regard, WWF will further organize a so-called investors roadshow in 2018 through different e ecoregions such as South America and East Asia for screening landscape restoration investment opportunities as we did in Chile and making links with investors. The first investors workshop will take place in Brazil um, in April. We will work on forest landscape restoration as part of an integrated landscape management. And integrated landscape management is a key to a more secure future for the Amazon, Cerrado, and Atlantic rainforest, as it will decide the future of land resources such as soil, water, and biodiversity. It will determine our success or failure in delivering poverty reduction, food and water security, and climate change mitigation and adaptation. We will invite investors, companies, governments, um, civil societies to join us to discuss, share, learn, and plan, and to do sustainable business together. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I invite you, Seth, uh, so to present us local financing mechanisms for forest and landscape restoration from ECOAG and FAA. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for describing what FLR is for all of us, so I don't have to do that. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll move into now a discussion of some of the financing mechanisms for FLR. So um, this is a piece of work that um, FAO is leading along with eco-agriculture partners, and it's a work in progress. So consider this presentation an invitation for collaboration. Uh, I'm going to lay out 
sort of a framework uh, for some guidance material for groups that are looking to fund or finance FLR. Uh, and <clears throat> there are a lot of kind of case material that can be brought in to, um, to build this out and to make it more clear. And, and FAO is working on that now and also working to make it into more kind of guidance material and not just a framework. So we, we um, decided to, uh, already did, sorry, to, to, to work on this because there's this identified need. Uh, their numbers are thrown around. Like, I've heard $35 billion a year needed for FLR. I've heard $300 billion a year needed to achieve land degradation neutrality. Um, so what, is, what does that actually mean? Well, uh, clearly, there are going to have to be a variety of sources of finance, but even if you know where the money is coming from, how would the money actually get from those people to the ground? And that was the question that, that FAO was asking. So <clears throat> for this presentation, I'm first going to talk about uh, some of these sources very briefly and what the investment needs will, will be specifically. So where does the money actually go? It's not just towards tree seedlings, although that would be a big thing. Like there's FLR includes a lot of, you know, not just asset investments, but enabling investments as well. Um, what exactly are the mechanisms that we would describe in this, um, in this manual? I'll give you some details on, on how we characterize those. And then finally, a big piece of this is how do these mechanisms work together? Because I think one thing that we do know, certainly if you're sort of a profit-seeking, um, if you're profit-seeking in any way, one of the main complaints you get is, well, you know, the deals aren't there, right? Or I, I can't make money here. It's not ready. So usually what happens is e even in cases where we have kind of successful profit making for FLR, there is some blending, there's some coordination of finance that happens. So we tried to dig into that a little bit. Okay, so very quickly, where's the money coming from in theory? In theory, it's coming from everywhere. So you have private sector, companies, banks, you know, so-called impact investors, uh, multilateral development institutions, bilateral, national programs in a variety of sort of subject areas. So there's the landscape restoration community, there's the red community, there's the climate smart agriculture world, which in many cases are working together, but sometimes they have their own pots of funds, and um, these kind of FLR programs can be kind of rebranded in different ways. And then, of course, there are all kinds of NGOs that are involved in this. The types of investment needs. All right, so we have needs for tree seedlings, you know, planting trees for agriculture um, inputs, uh, uh, new, new types of seeds, right? So things on the ground um, that are needed for FLR. But you also need infrastructure, green infrastructure, uh, high efficiency irrigation systems, for example. So that's what we call asset investment. Usually asset investment, it's something that's concrete and usually there's a return on the investment, although not necessarily. You can have something concrete that doesn't have a direct return on investment. And then we talk about enabling environment. So this is this can be sort of policy regulation type environment, but also investment in, in training for farmers. It can be uh, support for multi-stakeholder planning. If you're part of a, a, a landscape initiative, what we call integrated landscape management, that's also part of enabling investment. And often, this nobody wants to fund this, even though it underlies the successful asset investment. We think that, oh, well, there are just all these business opportunities. You hear kind of, you know, sort of pie in the sky clouds of like, oh, we've just got billions of dollars. We just need to spend it. And it's usually not that simple because nobody is investing in this. Okay, so not the point of this particular paper, but I wanted to touch on it because others have, have done this work. Generating the financial value through FLR. I, I didn't mention before, but from the FAO perspective, this work actually builds on another paper that they published in 2015. I don't see Ludwig Liagre here, but he was the lead author of that paper. Right? He's around somewhere. Um, and they got into business case and sources for FL, FLR, <coughs> um, FLR investment, which is why we're focusing here specific on the, fi the financial mechanisms. There's also some work that was done with Landscape for People, Food, and Nature, called Business for Sustainable Landscapes. And we have some flyers out there that tries to lay out business, ca like business cases for how you can 
make money off essentially sustainable land use investment. So there's you know, things like reducing risk, ensuring supply, reducing reputational risk, and then the categories of lowering business costs. And then finally, making money by accessing new markets or creating new markets. And I'm going to say a little bit about that because in the process of developing this work, there was a bit of confusion among those working on it of like, well, what is a financial mechanism? Is this a market mechanism or it's a financial mechanism? This was around uh, like payments for ecosystem services, which and it, we're trying not to get sort of too kind of academic-y about it, but it's sort of a, there's a buyer and a seller, it makes it a market mechanism, which is usually what payment for ecosystem service is. Um, also, accessing new markets for for new products, you know, maybe a tree-based product versus an annual product. So you could transition towards restoration by transitioning the type of crops that you're selling by creating a new market for something that didn't exist before. Um, and then also through accessing uh, kind of premium labeling schemes, sustainability standards. So maybe you're producing the same crop but in a more sustainable way before. So we, we go into some detail of how this works. Um, the conditions necessary to create these new markets or conditions necessary to produce PES, for example, um, secure property rights is important for PES. Um, more, most importantly, you need to find a buyer, but um, we could talk about that forever. I think whole books have been written about this and we don't have a lot of time, but just so you know it's, what's in there. Finally, the financial mechanisms. Well, what we, we consider a financial mechanism to be anything that essentially supports the establishment of market mechanisms and can scale up enterprises so that they have greater impact. We consider this our definition for market mechanism. And you have for-profit mechanisms and not-for-profit mechanisms. So for-profit, um, we, we went through kind of a laundry list. So you've got your debt and you have your equity. You have loans. We talked about the, the different uh, the, the sort of in conditions, under what conditions would you be interested in a short-term loan? Under what conditions would you be interested in a medium-term loan? Who would want these things and for what purpose? Um, equity investments, you know, for company. This, this, is, this is often where we hear about impact investment funds are usually doing something like this, investing in companies or supply chains. Um, we have real asset investment, which is investment in, in a forest, in agricultural land itself. Um, and then self-financing from companies and kind of individual family friends self-financing. So, for example, who would need a short-term loan in the context of FLR financing? Well, if you're in a place where there's small-scale farmers, in theory, these small-scale farmers would need short-term loans, loans that, 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 that kind of tied them over with working capital for the agricultural season. Um, this would allow them to you know, potentially buy seedlings, increase labor. If you need more labor for soil and water conservation practice, this is something you would need. The problem is that you, uh, that smallholders, even for any kind of, any type of input, whether it's sort of FLR or not, have very little access to, to financing at all. So local commercial banks, which are in the area nearby and might have the, the experience in risk mitigation, um, do not operate on the agricultural cycles. They often need hard collateral, which, which uh, smallholders don't have. So when, company, when smallholders do get these things, there has to be kind of some arrangement made. This is another issue of kind of blended finance. There's actually an example you know, of Gerhard's here. Tom tomorrow, um, we're having a session on a, something called the Landscape Investment Finance Tool. Um, which, is a, which is designed to help landscape partners access financing. Um, and one of the examples from a test we did in the Philippines is actually from a, um, a local bank trying to support kind of a cocoa agroforestry system. And it was very, very, they've been very proactive about it because it's not obvious to those actors that they should support these things. So that's like a big challenge. Look into uh, equity investments, Impact investors, kind of the big challenge there, that's, that's a case where you're actually owning a stake in a company. But if any of our impact investor friends are here in the audience, I, I don't know, the, the big complaint there is well, we can't find the deals. You know, it's like, it's not profitable. And that's why we need blending, which we'll talk about in a moment. 
Um, real asset investment can work very well, and more and more you see this type of thing. People basically just buying up degraded land, restoring it, getting profits from increased productivity and output while they own the land, and then getting the big profit from selling it once they've restored it because it's, it's worth more. But there are limitations on doing this in a landscape context because you can't just buy up all the, I mean, in a high density smallholder type landscape, you can't just buy up all the land, but there's a place for this also. Anyway, not-for-profit not mechanisms, I think that these are pretty self-explanatory. Grants from different sources, public finance instruments, direct investment, taxes, and subsidies. Okay, so coordination. So I'll talk about coordination of finance in, in three different ways. So the first is the blending of mechanisms um, kind of in a, a single case. You know, how can one impact investor... Like how can they reduce their risk enough to unlock the money? There's sequential coordination, which is very important. And then finally, a little bit about kind of spatial landscape scale coordination. For blended, blended um, mechanisms, I, I won't go into a whole typology of, of this you know, right now, but essentially here's some, here's some examples of where blended mechanisms work with impact investors. So... Um, the Althelia, which some of you may know. There's actually someone from Althelia I know who is at GLF. I don't know if he's here right now. Oh, are you from Althelia? Are you, uh... Oh, you read the case study. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, so if I say something that's incorrect, then please speak up. But has an agreement with USAID for risk guarantees for, I think, what, $40 million? Um, which allows them to enter a space that they otherwise would not enter. You know, so that's a case of of blending, so it's sort of public philanthropic money that will take the first risk. And then ideally, I suppose over time, once these um, kind of investment cases get enough of a track record, then maybe they won't, won't need that anymore. It's like one example. Another way that this happens is within a specific investment fund. So Eco Enterprises too, which was one of the early impact funds that operated in Latin America, is actually just a, a collection of this entire group of sources of fine, like, where am I going? Like, uh, you have basically J.P. Morgan is part of this. TNC is part of this. Um, uh, you've got, like, family offices that are part of it. It's like every type of funder kind of went into a single fund. Some of them needed high, higher level of returns. Some of them took lower level of returns. Some of them, some of them were in, in it for the environmental and social returns. And they managed to... Uh, get everyone on the same page to get a big pool of money together where everyone's happy. So that's another way of blending. Um, the Mor Moringa Fund is one where it's, there is kind of a uh, profit-seeking piece, and then there's a kind of a capacity-building piece where they take public and philanthropic money to sort of build on the enabling environment, so in the place where the profit-seeking piece thing comes in. All right. Okay, so finally, very, well, okay, don't try to read this. The point is that different investments are needed at different times. Okay, so you're, you're, um, you're trying to invest in a degraded watershed. You need to first enable an investment to come in for a plan, a planning process. You then need to stabilize and restore the upper watershed, which gets the water to flow. Once the water is flowing, you can invest in earthworks projects and irrigation systems. Once you have irrigation systems, you can start with the continuous financing of the farmers for inputs in markets so they can use the water, right? So you wouldn't invest in the farmers in a degraded area if you knew you were going to restore it before it was restored. So I think it might be obvious, but, you know, you'd be surprised um, that this doesn't happen. And finally, landscape scale coordination. This is our kind of beautiful, sustainable landscape. So just the, the only point here is that um, even within the definition of FLR, I think, agrees with the idea that, FLR is not just one thing. So we have smallholders doing climate smart agriculture practices. So FLR on its own, working with smallholders, this isn't exactly fully FLR because the L means landscape. You have smallholders. For smallholders to succeed, you need protected areas that protect ecosystem services. You need nearby forests that, that maintain, stabilize the microclimate. And all of this can feed into local agro-processing that's fed by the smallholders and feeds into export markets outside the landscape and cities. So the idealized version, obviously this is idealized, is that this can all work together. But 
this needs to be coordinated, which means investment needs to be coordinated. If you're interested in hearing more about how investment can be coordinated, come back tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and we can talk about uh, the Landscape Investment Finance Tool. So um, I think that's all I have for now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so now I, I invite the, the, well, I won't say the next speakers, but uh, we go for a conversation. So Faustin, Paul, and Mads, please join me for an informal conversation on forest landscape restoration. Oh, we have already our slide. Excellent. So can you take a seat? I think this slide that Paul has uh, kindly uh, provided us, I think it helps just to set the scene here. <laughs> uh, yes, the, the great momentum that we are living, it has been created by ambitious um, targets that we, we have under the, the bond challenge umbrella. But I think on this side, it helps us to, to understand exactly what it implies, right? So if, if we talk about a scale of uh, concessions that they would be around 10,000 hectares each, let's say which in, t in terms of if we think on a project scale, it's still a big project, it implies that we need to work with 35,000 concessions. And if we also think that in terms of restoration, we work with an average of 5,000 hectares per hectare, well, then in that case, it means that we are talking about uh, one trillion, over one trillion uh, US dollars of investment. Well, obviously, nothing of this will happen in this way. So that's the challenge we have. It's how can we work and find models which allows us to go here into uh, feasible numbers that we can then reach the uh, 350 million hectares in 13 years. And... Uh, so just to, to start diving on this um, and star starting by a, uh, a more high level uh, thinking on forest landscape rest restoration, uh, FAO, it's an it's a instrumental uh, organization on this. It sets the direction, the thinking, and um, FAO has also moved into the space of um, bringing landscape approach and forest landscape rest restoration to the way that uh, FAO is working and um, I don't know if today or tomorrow uh, it's launching a new publication also to um, uh, help communicate the new vision related with this so let's start there Faustine tell us a little bit about it thank you so um, I'm Faustine Zoveda and uh, as Louis told uh, I work for uh, FAO uh, indeed, uh, FAO is, um, I think, has been uh, moving forward uh, a lot in that arena uh, of uh, forest and landscape restoration and in the whole uh, landscape thinking uh, recently. Um, since a few years, we've been revising our strategic objectives and we put uh, really forward the aspect of sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, uh, sustainable everything, but in an integrated manner, like the integration, which was something that even for FAO wasn't really um, maybe uh, put forward as central, even though it was already somehow present in our work, really went at the center of the scene, and it's now something that we are actually actively promoting. So I think it's something important and worth recognizing FAO now at the heart of its strategic objectives has a sustainable agriculture uh, as an integrated uh, way of uh, acting, doing, uh, really put forward. And, um, and along those lines of, uh, of thinking and of putting uh, sustainability and integration at the center, uh, we are launching um, a publication that's called uh, Landscapes for Life. Uh, it's actually a soft launch, um, but uh, as you may have seen everywhere, there are some publications, and it's going to be a topic that will be discussed at the discussion forum at 4 o'clock, so um, it's, it's nice to just say a word about it. So uh, those landscapes approaches, uh, they have been present in the work of the organization since uh, a long time already, and we call them by different names, a bit depending on the 
angle by which we approach them, but we have watershed management, we have territorial development, we have forest and landscape restoration. Um, I mean, they are, many of them are listed in there, so uh, it's interesting to have a look at them, and it's also interesting to think about how those different approaches, through their own angles, they have been also uh, considering how to bring finance to the ground, uh, to the smallholders, where um, the, the positive impact and the positive change can, can really take place. So um, um, I think we're going to discuss a bit further about this aspect of bringing finance to the ground, but I will stop for now as uh, the idea is just to give you an overview of what we as FAO are trying to promote. Thank you. And uh, exactly following uh, this thinking, many organizations are now uh, uh, reorganizing their work and preparing uh, to change the way they prepare and they think the projects. And WWF is following uh, exactly that, that path. Uh, Paul Chetterton is uh, leading a new initiative we, we have in, in WWF. It's called the Landscapes Finance Lab. And it's exactly trying to uh, help WWF to upscale um, the models and the ideal projects which we work with. So, Paul, tell us a little bit about the lab. <clears throat> okay, thanks, thanks, Luis. Um, so, the lab aims to incubate sustainable landscapes. Just because you're working in a landscape doesn't mean you're doing the landscape approach. And uh, Seth knows this very well. We jointly produce the, the Little Sustainable Landscape book which sets out five elements, five steps to, to achieve the landscape approach. They're quite simple, but not easy to apply on the ground. The landscape lab takes those and creates a, an online incubator that guides people through the process of developing landscapes. And I'd welcome you to take a, take a look at it. Uh, and we can, uh, we, we're working with 15 landscapes at the moment from Fiji, Myanmar, Democratic Republic of Congo and others to, to incubate landscapes. I think uh, this was born from the idea that um, we had to work at a much larger scale if we're going to, to change the climate issues, save biodiversity, deal with poverty. Um, we can't be working at, at the scale of tens of thousands of hectares and it's, a, it's, it's an issue for, um, for forest landscape restoration as well. We can't do 35,000 projects in the next 10 years. It's not going to happen. We can do 350 million hectare projects in the next 10 years. And how do we do million hectare projects? That's, that's the challenge that we, can, we all have to face if we're going to deal with forest landscape restoration. Perhaps we do 100,000 hectares of forest restoration, but, we're, but it's set within an agricultural landscape, which is creating other types of value, and the forest creates value for the farmers. So it's a, it, it, as uh, Seth was saying, it's a, it's a much richer question, but it also adds to the complexity. How do we also make that simple? Thank you. And so we have the institutions who set the direction, the organizations which help us to enable the conditions and create the programs, but we need the doers, those who are on the ground and make things happen, who implement the projects. And that's why we have Mats here with us. <laughs> uh, Mats, uh, he will introduce himself, but uh, he has many years of uh, experience of working in Africa, exactly implementing one project. Uh, and uh, we'll have more opportunities to, to, to talk how we can scale up what we, you did in the past. But let's start by sharing with us a little bit the experience of your years uh, as CEO of Green Resources. Uh, th thank you. And I was also very uh, surprised uh, and possibly surprised just to realize that I represent youth. It says on my, <laughs> on my, my, my card here. So I'm very, very happy positive, to be very here. Very positive. <laughs> so um, uh, 20 years ago, I started uh, Green Resources and uh, for the last 10 years until a year and a half ago, I, I ran the company. Um, we, uh, we, we started planting trees in East Africa f f for commercial purposes with the objective of exporting the, 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 the wood. And I think this is important, uh, this development we have experienced is very important with regards to the, the 350 million hectares because we need to, you know, a, a key thing in, in thinking about these 350 million hectares or to finance that is that uh, what type of revenues can be uh, generated within uh, all by all these landscapes that need to be restored. There needs to be some revenues 
uh, if you're going to have any private engagement or if there's going to be any commercial financing or even non-commercial financing, you need to pay back the loans. If, and, and what we have experienced in uh, East Africa is that what we thought was going to be an export-oriented uh, business has completely turned into be a domestically-oriented uh, business. The local markets grow extremely fast. There's huge growth in, in, um, in uh, East Africa and many other places in Africa. So, so the, the market uh, locally uh, requires hu huge um, amounts of wood. And uh, when we think about uh, other sources of revenues, you know, there are, uh, eastern side of Africa at least, is uh, perfectly located towards the, the rest of the world's growth markets. I say the rest because uh, the uh, urban areas in Africa are probably growing faster than any other places on Earth, including China. But, you know, it's located next to India, and most importantly, where there's very little fiber. And it's close to, 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 to China, of course, also closer at least than many places in Latin America. Um, when, when, uh, and, and, and there's enormous um, uh, amount of fiber required there. And uh, you can have many hundreds of thousands of hectares of plantations to, 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 to meet that, uh, that uh, demand. Just back then to green resources and experience, uh, and I'm afraid I may talk too long, but, but we ended up planting 40,000 hectares uh, of forests so far. We ran out of money now, and uh, most of our colleagues doing similar things have, have had problems with financing, but we think we will, uh, and hope we will uh, will, uh, will manage through that. Uh, this 40,000 hectares sits on about uh, 100,000 hectares of landscapes. This is 40,000 hectares of eucalyptus and pine planted on places where eucalyptus and pine can be planted. And you have a dramatic improvement in biodiversity uh, in the remaining areas not planted on. Uh, this is mostly on hilly areas with, uh, with landslides and, uh, and deter. So, so you know, watershed management is, is an important uh, co-benefit here. And then... Typically, if you want to find large landscapes, they are at the end of the world. They are in uh, rural areas where you find the poorest people. So the side effect, the f and these are areas with no employment opportunities. So, so the benefit of, of these activities have been uh, overwhelming on the local communities. We have, you know, pre created, uh, at the peak we had more than 5,000 people employed, but we also we also generated more than half, two thirds of the all the all the public infrastructure built in these villages for the last 20 years in in at least half a dozen villages. So it's so it's a huge and, and this is not because we are nice, but because we we need this as to, to operate uh, in in this uh, setting. So, so uh, and and how do we do that fundamentally? The only way to do it is to 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 do good meaning you have to follow FSC, you have to follow the, the uh, new generation plantation thinking, uh, because if you don't do that, you screw up your relationship to the local community. Uh, and if you follow these guidelines, you also enable local uh, managers to operate, because you have the annual FSC certification, you have the carbon certification, you have, and, and, and this is something that the local foresters and managers can relate to and take pride in meeting. Uh, so it's a, actually a fantastic management tool, uh, purely for profit reasons, uh, in, on top of you know, being actually what we, what we want to do. So, so and, and the green resources, we, we planted more than our, 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 our competitors, but a number of other companies follow exactly, the other leading companies that have pl started planting in in sub-Saharan Africa since 2000 follow exactly the same principle now. And, and it's, it's really a, you know, a good group of, of people, I think, uh, doing that. So, so the main lesson is that you, you really, there's only one way of doing it, and that is to follow what is really the strictest international um, uh, ways of, of doing, a, a la taking a landscape approach. Thank you very much. And uh, Justin, you, you were talking also of uh, FAO experience in, in Africa, several countries yeah. where you are developing projects. I mean, um, I'm thinking in particular and linking with uh, the, the very good presentation that Seth made uh, about, the, about the paper. That the, the entire uh, rationale behi behind 
working with ECOAG on that paper was uh, that we could see that we were in our different projects um, tapping upon different uh, sources of finance and trying to promote different types of mechanisms, but we kind of, we were lacking the, the big picture and this kind of framework that would help us to really see, okay, this is how it can uh, happen on the ground. This is how it articulates. And, and this kind of uh, taking a step back and conceptualizing what we are doing on the ground was very important to us. So and just to give you an example, um, now um, we, we are about to, to, to launch and support a, a project in Niger and Burkina Faso for restoration where um, this aspect of uh, bringing uh, finance mechanisms, I mean bringing finance to uh, the smallholders is uh, really the, the, the central aspect of the, of the project. And uh, in the idea of, okay, how can we best use uh, the existing channels of um, the government, because we have a natural uh, counterpart um, in, uh, in these two countries that has been already very active and proactive in promoting forest and landscape restoration. So how can we use all the, the, the tools, the instruments that they already have for financing to um, really uh, encourage restoration to happen on the ground? So. Um, in Niger, what will happen, and in Burkina Faso as well, what will happen is that we will try to accompany uh, the decentralization process that is taking place. So uh, the government uh, transferring more responsibilities to the more local level, so the, the commune level, which is uh, a way of looking at the landscape approach in a jurisdictional uh, way, but still we can consider that as a landscape. Um, so uh, how can we use those channels of decentralization that goes together with, um, with, uh, with money flows to actually promote envelopes at the local level for planning restoration? And how can we um, combine, so again, this question of coordination uh, uh, and, and blending of, uh, of mechanisms, so how can we combine between an envelope for uh, restoration and uh, planning restoration and implementing restoration purposes that will be um, led by the decentralized government, so led by the commune level, how can we combine that type of finance and activities with, um, uh, for example, small grants, small project proposals where smallholders can apply and can put their own uh, maybe uh, investments in kind or not only in kind, but how can we complement those different types of mechanisms? So that's the reason why we were so interested in seeing how we could combine those different aspects. Excellent. And Paul, how can we combine those? <laughs> Well, if you look at the numbers again, a 10,000 hectare concession at $5,000 $5, per hectare is a $50 million project. So why, why do we not have more, more restoration projects going on? Why is this not commercial? Uh, and I think that's a, that's a key question we have to, we have to answer very, very soon. The, um, there is the money out there. It's all about structuring. It's about putting together the different pieces taking, going through a careful process to, to develop these with multi-stakeholder platforms, with various stakeholders who are doing different pieces. I'll, I'll give you an example. We're doing this at the moment in Fiji. Now, you wouldn't think that, that forest landscape restoration is a way to see, save reefs, but it's turned out to be the key tool to protect the reefs of Fiji. They won't be there in 30 years' time if we don't do forest landscape restoration by restoring 50,000 hectares of mangroves, river forests, and hill forests, we prevent the siltation that's smothering the reefs. We prevent the, we, the uh, fertilizer and pesticides that's coming off the, off the agriculture. And we create breeding grounds in the mangroves for, for the fish. This will have an impact on, on the fishing industry. The fishing industry will get much more productive if we do this. So, so it has a spin-off effect as well. So looking at the wider picture is more complex, but it's much more powerful and it brings people together. And we're seeing this in Fiji. It's remarkable, the connections that are being made. The Reserve Bank of Fiji is now stepping in 
and the Fijian Development Bank, they want to be part of this because they see this as a way to drive a whole lot of development in the outer islands of Fiji, which are going to be, which are deeply threatened by, by climate change. Excellent. So we need more forest landscape restoration, which has commercial dimension that can be attractive to private investors. Is that it? Mads, can we use uh, the capacity of businesses like Green Resources to move from your, you said, how many hectares you planted? 40,000. 40,000 to 100,000 100, of, uh, or million of hectares in a landscape scale? How is that possible? Yeah. To, uh, and if you include the uh, 10 to 20,000 hectares of uh, small scale plantations that farmers have created their own plantations, maybe 150,000 hectares of landscapes. But uh, th there is some capacity, but I think overall there's a dramatic uh, shortage of capacity and management. And I think that in your you know, investment enabling, uh, when you had the investment enabling uh, uh, factors, the one big thing missing was management. Uh, you know, because this is, this is not uh, easy and you have to have people, you have to, to, to bring up at Green Resources, we recruited uh, chiefly from the local universities, They're extremely talented people. Uh, coming in, but they have to be trained, and it takes years. Uh, we have we, 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 we group people from from Makerere in Uganda to become directors of the company, uh, and that's very possible, but it takes you know ten years. Uh, so management is 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 uh, important, and it's short. Uh, I personally, if you look at Africa and uh, the type of uh, people we, that's been very productive, is actually people from uh, from uh, South America. Uh, who has a lot of expertise and know plantation forestry uh, more than most. So we can learn a lot from them. Uh, they are very good operators and have been planting, you know, tens of thousands of uh, hectares per year, if not a million, maybe even, uh, yeah, not per year. But, so, but the capacity is, um, is a problem. And uh, you can, it is not possible to plant uh, 100,000 hectares, establish 100,000 hectares of plantations in, in Africa today or, or, or two years from now because there's no capacity to do it. So something has to happen on that score. And, and tree breeding, you know, uh, uh, computerizing or whatever, using technology, it's a huge benefit here. Um, there's no problem going far beyond what is used in Europe in forestry management with regards to technology. The forestry sector in, in Europe is... is, is, is quite old-fashioned, yeah? And in, in Britain, you still do a lot of mechanical stuff. You just need to completely leapfrog this, and the young African managers you hire are, have no problem uh, uh, coping and, 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 and flourish under those types of settings, and, and that's one way of, 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 uh, of getting there. Thank you. And uh, I think this is the moment we open to the, to the audience, so if someone wants to to make a comment or pose a question, please just raise your hand. There you are. So just say your name and organization, please. Um, I'm Diego de Leon. I'm uh, currently a master's student at Columbia University. Um, if uh, ECHO um, Agriculture could you specify what report were you talking about? I, it was not clear, I think, a little bit um, on the one that you presented um, and also how this is about restoration, but that your research found something conclusive on conservation. So how about just not, you know, touring down what is still there? Why, um, if, if there are financial mechanisms that look at conserving um, rather than restoring? Okay, the first, well, the first question, you're, you're asking about the publication that I was pre presenting. It's a work in progress that is not published. Um, and the, the process is that FAO now is filling it out with case material uh, and putting it into kind of a manual form. So... so there, there, are, there are elements of it that are that sort of you can find elsewhere, which I can tell you. But that particular publication is. Yeah. Um, do you want anything else to say about that? 
if you are specifically interested in uh, in having a look at it, in in um, contributing with the case, um, I'm not the person responsible for it, but I'm sure that we can uh, maybe informally share an exchange with you. We're uh, still in the process of making it something that can be actually uh, usable by <laughs> by people who are interested. So mm -hmm. feedbacks are welcome. Yes. First and then the lady. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Caroline van Leenus, Dutch government. Um, I've been hearing last time many times that it seems like there's a new job on the horizon, how to structure deals uh, in landscapes on the ground. Um, at Wageningen University, there's the start of a landscape, uh, uh, landscape um, academy, but that's digital. But maybe we should combine efforts more on making this new job as a real profession and maybe see how we can collaborate on um, making more noise that this is, you know, a future proof uh, uh, job opportunities and see how we can learn from the best examples and bring together people who have been doing it really in practice because I think that that's what is really needed to scale up and make it, uh, make it more attractable for for larger investors, so maybe we can, you know, help each other out on that one. I, I, th I think you're absolutely right. The, this is like the Industrial Revolution. There weren't any engineers until people realised you need, needed someone trained up to put all of the pieces together to make a bridge or a railway, and they created the, the profession called engineers. We need landscape architects, landscape gardeners, uh, we had. Now we need landscape architects, and it's not a simple thing. Anyone else wants to comment on this very interesting? Just, just to come back to the point that, yes, capacity development is key. Uh, it's part, I think, of the investments that you mentioned uh, in the enabling environment, no? Uh, and uh, I think that we, uh, as technical partners, would see in this very specific context as a we would see ourselves as, a, as a investors in the enabling envi environment. So uh, definitely this is something that we as FAO are totally considering. Uh, we are considering it through various modalities. Uh, yes, there are the aspects of trainings, on the ground trainings. I know that in some of our projects this is something that was considered. Wow, should we, could we have some sort of a curricula, a master's curricula even, that would give you the title of a, a landscape uh, um, um, business uh, planner or I mean so, so there, there, these are things that are on the making. One uh, interesting development probably is that with the work that we are doing, uh, we put emphasis and focus on the development of communities of practice, online communities of practice, uh, which uh, obviously cannot cover everything, but are a good and interesting opportunity to reach out to a wide number of practitioners. And one of our interests is to see how we can uh, develop a community of practice, a wide community of practice on finance. And so the experience of both the people who are uh, striving to become those uh, uh, landscape facilitators, or I don't know how you would call them, but uh, putting them in contact as well with the, the people who are looking to invest and, and uh, making sure that there is this matching of opportunities is an important thing. No, as you said, with business schools, making it sexy and not about <laughs> capacity building. I'm not, I'm not, you know, it's not, not to put things down, but, you know, making it a real sexy uh, uh, job opportunity for the future, you know, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talking on behalf of the youth in East Africa, <laughs> uh, this is sexy. So, 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 so there are, if you go to, if you go to Uganda, Mozambique and, and Tanzania, uh, you, they, they recruit, unlike Norway where I come from, uh, the best students uh, to these professions. So that's what one reason for operating in this. If you want to be at the cutting edge of, 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 of this in the world, you, you, you go there. But on, on the when it comes to capacity building, there's also, uh, I think the most important thing missing is, is, is just good business practices. Cost cutting, cost control are, are, is very important. Unfortunately, all of us, the private companies, we all spend too much money. And that is one reason why investors are are uh, are um, are disappointed. 
uh, and we have created some problems for you guys that's going to raise new money and ourselves. Uh, we have made a lot of mistakes, of course. Also, when I talk about uh, FSC and stuff, and you know, everything is not, uh, you know, on that front. I should also add that you know we have made plenty of mistakes with regards to stakeholder relations and, and environmental issues. But also, but most importantly, I think on cost control, and we have spent too much money, partly because things have taken too long. Time is a huge cost uh, driver, so you need to, you have to compress things and get things on. And then, of course, you have this excuse that the financing wasn't there, so we had to spend another year, another two years, and then the cost just accumulates. But, but I think there is the, the learning curve, and right, that's that's what drives us here. Simon. Thanks very much. Um, Simon Petley from WWF, also WWF UK. Um, I lead a, a program called Trillion Trees on behalf of WWF. It's a partnership with WCS and BirdLife. Uh, it's a 25-year aspiration to unlock funding into um, forests, restoration, avoided loss and protection. And, well, first of all, just to commend um, Seth and Faustine on the report, on the report in progress, because... This absolutely captures it perfectly for me, and, and the way you framed it is exactly the way that we want to proceed with Trillion Trees. So we definitely see that opportunity to invest or to frame opportunities to invest in the enabling condition, and then to look at as assets underneath. And for us, it was about um, showcasing opportunities to invest and then highlighting that to the investment community more widely. So really excited about this really want to talk about how we can engage with the process. Um, and I wonder what the next, what, what you saw as the next step. You've, you've identified some projects in Burkina Faso and Niger. Trillion Trees at the moment is working, just started working in Tanzania, um, in another, the other partners more widely in Africa. So what's next? <laughs> wow. <laughs> First of all, thank you. Um, uh, so for the what's next for the document itself, uh, I think that uh, Seth has already um, given you a little bit of, uh, of um, information about that. So uh, we're still in the process of uh, finalizing it, uh, capturing uh, additional case studies. If you have uh, cases that can be uh, of interest to build and fill into that publication, so um, we can consider to share bilaterally with you just as uh, I told to Diego uh, the publication if you're I mean the draft draft um, for you to see if you want to contribute and we can see if that uh, if your potential case study matches so that's one thing then I think that in terms of next steps so there is this aspect of implementation because some of the things that we highlight uh, in the publication as uh, ways of, of coordinating investments. We are already putting them in practice, or we will be putting them in practice on the ground to support uh, several countries. So I talked about Niger and Burkina Faso, but uh, we are also active in, in other countries and uh, on supporting different things. And then there is this whole aspect of capacity development that I was mentioning, because this is what somehow accompanies and is the, the common thread across all of our efforts. So I think that what we now want to do is really see how we can structure those materials into something that is more palatable for the practitioners, for the people who would need that on the ground, and also see how we can really widely disseminate this type of, uh, of products to those who are interested. Thank you. Uh, any further question or comment from the audience? Yes. Hi, uh, Will from uh, SNV, based in Vietnam. Um, f f first of all, uh, I th we're an organisation works on the ground. Uh, I think a lot of our agricultural work, um, almost all our agricultural work, falls under forest and landscape uh, restoration, um, whatever the commodity and, and, the, lands and the landscape that's in. Um, I, th I think we, on the positive side, would nearly always hit uh, quite a long way under $5,000 per hectare, but we're nowhere near uh, working at a landscape level. And in, in Vietnam, the provinces tend to be around a million hectares each, um, and you know, it, it just kind of wouldn't be not, fi not feasible to work at that scale. And, and my question is, uh, having come from some sessions earlier today on scale and aggregation and developing uh, you know, investable or 
um, investable projects or uh, ag aggregating groups of stakeholders into something that's kind of financially viable, you really need to standardize the, standardize the products. So like with cars or with mortgages, effectively banks just simplify the whole thing and they can kind of very quickly just uh, pretend everything's effectively the same. And with farms of different size and commodities of different size in the mosaic landscape that we all know is out there and that Faustine talked about, that's very difficult. So for us, maybe with working at, with a few thousand smallholders, uh, with a few hectares each, and to some extent we can try and pretend they're very, very similar. Um, but that gets us a few thousand smallholders with a few hectares, puts me in your large concession of 10,000 hectares. So I'm interested to know how you think we're going to deal with complexity at a million hectares. I think that's, <clears throat> that's the fundamental question for the age in terms of forest landscape restoration. Uh, we, have, we have a standardization now on the landscape approach. The, 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 the terminology and the process is reasonably well accepted and many, many organizations are now picking that up. The, um, the financing is another, another question. Um, how you how you measure forest landscape restoration? I mean, uh, I've asked a few people. Mads and I were talking about this uh, last night. How many hectares of forest has been restored in the last ten years? No one can tell you. It's somewhere between between half a million and five million hectares, probably. Now, if you assume that, we've got to get seventy to seven hundred times faster this decade than we have been last decade. So that doesn't mean using the tools that we have at the moment. It means creating a completely new, different, new set of tools. And what are they going to be? The first step is to start measuring it. There is, there's a nice measurement system for commitments for forest landscape restoration. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no measurement system for forest le landscape restoration on the ground. That's where we now have to focus as a group. And we've got to get that measurement website up and running immediately and the next step is then to, to everyone who's doing that start sharing sharing lessons with each other we're starting to do that and i commend landscapes for people food and nature as a super platform for doing this there are many others uh, um, but yeah we've got a challenge ahead of us I, I suspect that there are many places in africa that are very much simpler than in uh, vietnam uh, in, in northern Mozambique, for example, uh, Mozambique is an underpopulated country. Uh, in northern Mozambique, we had we had run a program with 1,300 uh, farmers in Luria and some more up in Nyasa, and we just worked on um, three staple crops. And it was very simple to, to, to do some plowing, give them improved seeds, uh, help them with some 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 uh, assistance on the, on the technical side, and then help them sell it. Uh, and that had huge impact on, on the farmer side. I'm sure Vietnam is much more complex, but, uh, and, and then you add some uh, non-wood forest products, which also are quite attractive. Um, you help them in Mozambique. It was very difficult with the oat growers or because there was no cash, um, uh, cash market for the final product yet, so they have a hard time to admission holder to sell the trees down the road. But in the southern highlands of Tanzania, you have had an enormous, you had tens of thousands of small farmers planting between uh, 100 and 200,000 uh, hectares of forest over the last, uh, uh, and it's a small farm forest, most of them, over the last 20 years, uh, catalyzed by the corporate activity going on in the region and the seedlings we made and all that stuff. So, so um, I, I, it's, it, this is not that di uh, difficult many places. You want to add something? And the standardization aspect for you. Uh, standardization uh, on, on the on the on the farming side, it was it uh, it was maize, uh, um, you know, soy, simsim, groundnut, and uh, you know the, what we could uh, help them with was to store it and help them finance the store it so they could they could sell it at a higher price than just when the when the crop came out. So that added a lot of value. Um, on the on the wood product side, uh, the driver of this 100 to 200,000 hectares of uh, smallholder forest in the southern highlands of Tanzania were two things. One was pine sawn timber, 
which was a rapidly growing market in uh, in Tanzania. Most of that was done by, you know, many dozens of small sawmillers, but also some big companies. And then you had the the utility pole business, which where, where East Africa had imported a lot of utility poles and where some corporates, us included, but a number of other, New Forest Company, which is part of, of the uh, NGP, for example, um, uh, they, they, we put in new standards. Uh, it's very easy to cheat making utility poles. And if you have quality you know, standards put in place, uh, you get a higher price and you can sell. So that was a type of, a, I think, very successful standardization of a product that enabled us then to dramatically increase our procurement of, of lo locally sourced uh, eucalyptus poles and became a hugely attractive cash business for the smallholders, which, which then drove more planting. Okay. We go now for a final question from the audience and then we'll need to close. Thanks. It's just a follow-up on the standardization, which is a really interesting point. Uh, my name is Jessica Chalmers. I work with the Sustainable Agriculture Network, SAN, Red the Agricultura Sustainible, and for the last 20 years have worked in partnership with the Rainforest Alliance on the certification system. SAN develops the standard on which certification is based. And reflecting on what that's done over the last 20 years, but what has happened more recently is that Exactly as you say, in certain regions of the world where you don't have the 10,000 hectares, you have multiple mosaics of smallholders, the reality is that you can't standardize those groups and the reality of trying to get financing for those projects, you can't just create one big, in the way they do with wind farms, it's all standard, pass it through, stick the label on it, it's all the same. It just isn't and I don't think we should pretend that it could be. Um, and the other one, kind of to mention about the, what we see in SAN as the trend away from standardization, actually, because standards, you mentioned FSC, are a great tool, but they've been overused as the only tool. And I think what we have to recognize is there's a move towards understanding what the impacts are that you're trying to achieve, not to label something as best practice because it's a standard, but to measure the impacts. And I think... So standardization has a role, but not to plug it as the, the only role. Thank you. Of Thank course, FSC is not an impact measure. There are plenty of, there are good standards for impact measures also. Uh, but if you want to decentralize and get the local population to do this, standards are fantastic. FSC has done fantastic things for workers, for the environment, uh, protecting people. Uh, so they're very valuable and uh, they may not create that much work for the people sitting here, but uh, it sure creates fantastic, interesting job opportunities for, for people, uh, the youth of uh, East Africa. Okay, I think we'll need to, to close now. Uh, I want to give just a, a final opportunity for our invitees, just a final word, a final sentence, a final thought from each of you. So, Mats. Yeah. Yeah, on on uh, what's the driver of this, 350 million is, uh, is huge, but I think that uh, the world needs uh, building materials that are ecologically sound, and wood is a fantastic building material. Costs are coming down for building materials, and, and wood will be used in many more applications. Uh, there is less and less natural forest left, so we need hardwood. Eucalyptus can be used for many, many wood applications. Um, uh, we need to decarbonize the transport fuels and we need to have uh, huge plantations to be able to produce biofuel in an economical way. Uh, and uh, uh, there are many other uses of, uh, many other sources of income from uh, this potential uh, uh, huge uh, forest. And uh, I think uh, that will happen. Okay. So. Um I think that this will only happen if we manage to put uh, the different mechanisms for coordination uh, in practice, be it uh, at landscape uh, scale, be it across the different types of finance, but also uh, a long time, because for that to happen, it really means that different types of players will have to uh, progressively get on board, and this is really what we believe in, and this is what we are tr striving to um, develop capacities for. And talking about the money, <coughs> the climate, climate bonds, uh, 
over the last 10 years are valued at about $800 billion. So the money is out there, and that's for SDGs, it's for land. Only 1% of that $800 billion has gone to the land sector, though. And that's because of, because of the structuring, because for exactly this question, that, that it's, small, it's small scale, that that's, um, it's too small scale to deal, to deal with that, that level of, of finance that's needed. So how do, we, how do we keep it small? We absolutely have to keep it small. It has to work in every village for every family, but it has to, it has to aggregate to the, to the scale of a million hectares and $100 billion each time. That's our challenge, and we need to come back here next year with that one answered. Thank you. And uh, let's make this the most attractive profession to youth, and then we'll be <laughs> sure that we will succeed. So thank you for joining me in this very, very nice conversation. Thank you for our two speakers and for all of you for joining us in this moment. So see you soon.